Welcome to Writers Week Day 2. Please turn and find your English teacher somewhere, wherever they're sitting near you, away from you. Give them a wave, a thank you, an air five. Thank them for bringing you. Yeah, this is Schaefer. Um, also, a huge thank you to Writers Week's possible for lots of reasons. Um, one, your boosters. If your parent is a booster, please go home and thank them. Um, also, over here in the corners, if you walk in and out of Writers Week before or after the hour, you'll notice these two um, gorgeous people always in conversation or enraptured by the stage. Uh, Mrs. Ank and Mr. Anderson, they make this possible. They do work all year round, so please give them a huge round of applause. One thing you may know is your English teachers um, were readers, right, like you, and we are huge fans of the people that come onto this stage. Um, we are, these, these are our rock stars. Uh, Mark Arshiro, who is our guest today, knows uh, that he's a rock star to me. I, I chased him down in a Barnes & Noble once uh, so that I could have an opportunity to meet them and uh, didn't run, and we, we engaged in conversation. You gave me a book recommendation, actually. Um, it was The Darkness. The, the, um, Stars in the Black is Between Them. Yes. Which just won. Uh, Kreska. Was it? No, Snowball won. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. 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 Um, so that's sitting on my, on my to read um, shelf. Thanks, Mark. So we talk books. Um, today, Mark is going to talk about a novel um, that they have written, Anger is a Gift. Um, it was on BuzzFeed's 24 Best YA Books of 2018, um, Vulture's 38 Best LGBTQYA Novels, Book Riot's Best Books of 2018. This is a hyped, talked about book. Mark is a wonderful human being who is also an editor who also reviews movie, TV shows, sorry, TV shows and books. You can follow him online at Mark Does Stuff. Um, it is such an honor to be able to introduce you. I'm so glad you're here. Mark Oshiro, let's hear it for Mark. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks, personal cheerleading section. Glad. I hope you get the money. Um, okay. What am I doing? <laughs> this is the third one of these is done uh, today. Uh, I feel like I'm running purely on adrenaline at this point, uh, especially because every time we get to Q&A at the end, it's just turned into chaos hour. It's great. I'm so excited. So my name's Mark. Here's how this will work. I'm going to read a little bit of Anger's Gift to you. Then I have a presentation for you. It's about 20, 25 minutes long. I'm just going to talk a little bit about my upbringing, why I write what I write, who I am, um, and what it's like to be an author, because this is my full-time job. Um, after that, we move into question and answer, period. You can ask me about anything. It doesn't have to be about books, but the threat is this. If we get to that and you, no one raises their hand, I'm just going to start calling on random people and asking you incredibly uncomfortable personal questions. Yeah. Like, who was the last boy you kissed? Who do you currently have a crush on? I don't care, I'll do it. I don't go to the school, I don't have to deal with the ramifications. I'll do it. So, now you know, you're welcome. Here we go, I don't actually, you know what? I'm gonna read a different section than I've read from the other two. So I'm gonna start at the very beginning of this book. This is my first book, it's called Anger's a Gift. I will talk about my other books later on, but here we go. He saw the lights first, blue and red flashing in a regular pattern. Lots of them scattered south of the station in the parking lot, and he couldn't help himself. Moss had boarded the train in San Francisco that afternoon, expecting nothing out of the ordinary, just a normal ride home with his best friend, Esperanza. The train was crowded, plenty of people eager to get back home at the end of the weekend. They'd been lucky to find an empty space near, uh, an empty set of seats near one of the doors, Moss had leaned his bike up against the side of the car and scrambled to claim the spot next to Esperanza. Then their luck had worn off. The train now sat motionless, caught between the Embarcadero station and West Oakland, where both of them were bound. Moss closed his eyes and sighed. We're never going to get off this train, I swear. He looked over at Esperanza, who had taken her half of the headphones out from her left ear. Moss could hear the tinny sound of Janelle Monet as he removed his own earbud. His best friend's head was thrown back over the seat in frustration. She removed her thick framed glasses and began to rub her eyes. This is it, Esperanza said. This is where we'll be stuck for all eternity. Well, we can't be stuck here forever, he replied. They'll do that, that, that thing they do where they just redirect us around a train. He narrowed his eyes at her. Can they even do that here? 
Esperanza sighed while putting her glasses back on. I don't know, she replied. I haven't actually ever been stuck inside the tube itself. For reference, there is a giant tube under the ground in the bay in San Francisco, and every time I went in it, it was terrifying. What if it collapsed on things? Now I have anxiety. Okay, I gave myself anxiety. Good job, Mark. Okay, it's giving me the creeps, he said. What happens if there's an earthquake while we're down here? She slapped Moss's arm playfully. Don't say that. That practically guarantees it's going to happen. Well, then this really is like the start of all good apocalyptic nightmares, he said. Well, we better get used to living here, Moss. There's no escape for us. Our life as we know it is over, which means we need to start planning out how we'll design our new home. She stood up, grinning, her white blouse hanging loose on her body, and she gestured above the bar doors next to her. We'll definitely have to install some curtains here, she explained. I'm thinking something that's gray to accent the dreariness of this place. He shook his head. I am a man of high taste, he said, in the most grandiose voice he could manage. This is always their game. I cannot rest my body on this filth. He pretended to be deep in thought before exclaiming, I've got it. We need bunk beds. What a dumb joke. Uh, sorry. Uh, they'll save us space and give this place a youthful atmosphere. Esperanza faked to swoon back into her seat. Moss, you are just so full of good ideas. Plus, it, respe- it speaks to the reality of the situation. We shall remain celibate for the rest of our lives down here, as I highly doubt that there are any cute girls for me on this train. Hey, speak for yourself, Ma Shopback. I'm pretty sure I saw a, a hot dude with a fixie a few cars down. Oh, so you're going to corner the hipster market on the train. Smart, Moss. Very smart. You think so? Well, I mean, they're young. They're ambitious. Lots of disposable income. And they're willing to gentrify your neighborhood at the drop of a cupcake. I'm going to end it there, because now I want cupcakes. There's cupcakes in that green room, aren't there? Are there not cupcakes in that green room? I'm going to go eat all of those cupcakes. I'm going to gentrify those cupcakes. Okay, all right, all right. Hi, everyone. My name is Mark Oshiro. Uh, I am a queer and Latinx author, and I write books for kids. I'm very upfront about these two things, and I'm upfront with them at every school visit I do, which means that I basically just came out to a bunch of strangers. Um, and I do that because I grew up in a place where I was not allowed to be out. You got beat up, or worse. Um, where I grew up. So I like to be up front of that and be myself. So I'm going to be myself for all of you for the next 40 minutes. Um, I'm also up front about being Latinx. Uh, I like to tell people that I am ambiguously brown. I'm that kind of brown where people look at me and then they try to guess what country I'm from and they're always wrong. Also, it's a real offensive game. Maybe don't play that with strangers. Um, uh, uh, I am up front about that too because people are often very confused by my last name. If you're familiar with it, it is a traditional Japanese name. No, I'm not Japanese. And people will look at me Actually, and I, I've told this story twice now, but my first school visit ever was outside Naperville, and a kid, during question and answer, raised their hand, and their question was, yo, why aren't you Asian? <laughs> and my reply, because I'm an asshole, was, well, because it's not a video game, I didn't get to choose Asian at the beginning, that's not how this works. Um, but anyway, I'm going to explain a little bit more about that and why that's important, because it affects my work. So, let's talk. How long have I wanted to be a writer? I am one of those rare people who I knew what I wanted to do when I was a kid. Uh, I wanted a book with my name on the cover. I loved reading. I started reading at the age of four. Um, I was telling stories by the time I was in first grade. I would just make up stories and tell them on the playground. Um, I read my first book intended for adults when I was eight years old. Um, So I was reading far, far, far above my grade level uh, very early on. I would check out the maximum amount of books every two weeks at the library whenever my mom took me there. And for reference, that is 20 books every two weeks. So for probably a solid 10 years, Um, I read 20 books a week, uh, 20 books every two weeks. Uh, I read the entirety of my junior high school uh, library in eight months. Uh, I loved reading. It was the thing I, I loved escaping into worlds. I liked contemporary. I liked fantasy. I liked horror. I liked all of it. Um, And then I started writing in elementary school and I didn't stop for a long time. Most of these stories weren't good, but uh, I liked writing. I liked the act of creating a story. Um, If you are curious, by the way, the book that I read when I was eight years old, oh boy. Some of you have read that and know that it should not have been read when I was eight years old because there are a lot of adult things in it. It's also really gay. Um, Okay, anyway. What was I like as a teenager? Not that. Uh, um, This is actually a photo of me and my identical twin brother. There's another version of me out in the world. He lives in Baltimore. He's my best friend. I love him. Uh, So surprising absolutely no one. I was a giant nerd as a teenager. I grew up in Riverside, California. That is about 85, 90 miles east of Los Angeles and 85, 90 miles east of everything cool in California. Because we were like, you grew up in California, but you went to the beach. And I was like, yeah, it was like two and a half hours to the beach. No, I live next to sand dunes and orange groves and a bunch of racism. It was great. Um, people were like, what was the import of Riverside? It was like homophobia. Um, 
I make that joke. My hometown voted 98% in favor of Prop 8, which was the, the proposition in 2008 to ban gay marriage, including my mother. Okay, so oh, I'm gonna be very real with all of you for the next half hour, cool. Uh, I am also what's called a transracial adoptee. If you've never heard that term transracial, you might have heard of it because Rachel Dolezal stole it from all of us and I hate her. That's not what that word means. Uh, a transracial adoptee is someone who is adopted out of the ethnic or racial culture they were born in and brought into another one. So my twin brother and I, our parents are from Mexico, El Salvador, uh, Guatemalan. We think our mom is part white, we don't know because that's part of the, the challenge of being adopted. We don't ever know. Um, but my adopted mom is white. My adopted dad was Japanese and Hawaiian, hence why I have a Japanese last name. Um, I was the smart kid in junior high and high school. It's not surprising, I was a giant nerd. I did it track and cross country. Um, I actually still do long distance running every day. I got up this morning at 6 a.m. so I could run five miles. Not outside though. It is too damn cold here, I don't like it. I grew up in the desert, sorry, I'm judging all of you. So, um, why do I write what I write? So I get this a lot. Mark, why did you write such a dark book? Why is your book so challenging? Why is it so hard to read? Um, and I put dark in quotes, because I actually don't like that descriptor for a book. Um, uh, I get asked why I chose to write about teenagers experiencing immense hardship. So much of my book is autobiographical in some form. I borrowed from many of my experiences. I went to a high school very similar to the ones that the characters in this book did. Um, and I uh, had a difficult upbringing, a challenging childhood, um, and I write from this place of wanting to talk about these difficult things because no one talked about them when I was a teenager. I grew up very much in, the, in, in this idea that we need to, or what I was raised with was we need to protect kids so we can't introduce them to anything dangerous or scary or weird or complicated or challenging because if we keep that stuff away, then they'll be perfect and never have to go through them. Um, that being said, I still dealt with things like child abuse, racism, homophobia as a kid, so it always rings unfair to me when adults say that kids, that none of you should be exposed to this sort of stuff because what it does is it leaves out people like me. I, didn't, I couldn't opt out of this. I couldn't opt out of the things that I went through. I had a very difficult childhood. So when, you, when I hear adults say like, we shouldn't introduce this stuff to other teenagers, what are they doing for the kids who don't have a choice about that? Um, and so I'm gonna be very specific with you two. So um, one of the things that I had to deal with and it sort of affected my entire life, when I was uh, 16 years old, uh, my mom kicked me out of the house for being gay. Uh, and I was homeless my junior year of high school. Uh, I had to get a full-time job while in high school uh, and in AP classes. Um, so I was alternately living on the street or couch surfing with friends. And the thing that like, I think about and what I was thinking about when I was writing Anger is a Gift is this notion that I had to be an adult when everyone else around me was a teenager. Um, and so I find that a lot of the things I write, even though the stories have nothing to do with one another, almost every single one of my books, um, and I'm currently working on books like three, four, and five, they're still about kids who have to deal with very adult things that are happening in their lives. And I know where that comes from. It comes from this experience. You know, I think about things about who is allowed to be a kid, who is forced into adult-like decisions in our world. And what I needed most when I was 16 was someone to tell me that the things that I could, was going through could be conquered. And that's what I write about. And that's what happens in Anger is a Gift. That's what happens in my next book. Um, we're gonna talk about those things a little bit later. Um, so I sort of write from that place. That's why my background matters so much um, to my creative work. So after high school, um, uh, you know, despite all these things that I faced and went through, I'm, ex I'm so petty, y'all. I have a folder on my laptop and it just is called Petty and, and it is alphabetized receipts on all of the terrible people on the internet. Um, do I know what I'm gonna use them for someday? No, but I have them. Um, so every time I see like one of my like mutuals, if they like say something like racist or homophobic, I just screenshot it and then alphabetically put it in a folder. I, this sounds like a nightmare. I am a nightmare, I don't care. So I was very petty even in high school. Uh, I put up here, Petty Ravenclaw, because I knew that I had to succeed on my own so I could get out of this tiny desert city and get out into the world. Um, so I worked incredibly hard. I was valedictorian in my high school. I got a 4.34 GPA. I got a full ride scholarship to this university, Castling Long Beach, where I started as an English creative writing major. I had this whole plan. I was gonna go to college, I was gonna get my MFA, and then by 25, I was gonna have a book with my name on it. And that was my path, and I was so certain of it. Um, it derailed pretty quickly. 
First of all, I lasted one semester in the creative writing department. Uh, I hated it there. And part of the reason was I chose a school that wasn't really known for it. And the professors at the school did not believe that fantasy, science fiction, horror, speculative fiction, all that stuff wasn't real literature. And so I would write these incredibly weird stories and they're like, yeah, this isn't real. This isn't a story. This isn't a book. Uh, you need to write like literary important stuff. Which to them just means a 45 year old white teacher who has a crush on a 17 year old student and gets really sad about it. <laughs> you think I'm joking, that was like, I don't know, 70, 80% of the stories that were read in this class. And I was like, y'all are 18, how are you writing stories like this? It's terrible. So I switched to political science. Um, I attended Cal State Long Beach for three and a half years. My idea was I was gonna study politics, but I was still gonna write, and I was still gonna publish that book. Um, then it got derailed in a major way. Uh, so all of you are looking at a college dropout. I don't have a degree. And actually, if you do the math, I have one semester of any training as a writer. Um, the last semester of my, of my college experience, um, the scholarship I was on decided to rescind paying for room and board. And I got a bill the first day for $9,500. And they said, if you can't pay this in seven days, you have to leave the school. So it wasn't so much that I dropped. I did make the decision, but I was mostly forced out financially. Um, it was a very difficult thing to go through because how many of you have ever, I don't know, read a book, seen a movie, watched a TV show about the valedictorian being the first in their class to drop out of college? I didn't know what to do. I'd never heard this story before. I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, so I spent three years working some very strange jobs around Los Angeles. You can ask me about them. Uh, I mean, I worked at Ticketmaster. I did a lot of editorial gigs. I was an overnight cook at this bougie-ass restaurant in West Hollywood where I once got to serve the Beastie Boys, which was pretty cool. They all tipped me $100 each. Good job, Beastie Boys. Um, yeah, it was a weird time. Here's the reason it was a weird time. I stopped writing. Even if I was editing, I stopped writing for myself. Um, and I started thinking that I wasn't going to write again, and that wasn't going to be my career, and I didn't know what I was going to do. In 2005, uh, at the bidding of some of my friends who were like, why aren't you writing? You should submit a writing sample to this company. I got hired at a startup called BuzzNet and spent uh, about a decade as an online journalist in the music industry. I got to travel North America and Europe, touring with bands, musicians, artists, singers, writing about their lives, writing about what it was like to be a touring artist. Uh, I had the time of my life. I am so thankful for this job. One, because I got to meet many of my heroes and find out that they're actually great people, which is not a thing that you hear. You hear like, oh, all these famous people are assholes. Most of them weren't actually. Um, this is an example of some of my photography work. That's Henry Rollins, that was at Coachella. I went to Coachella seven years in a row. Um, it was an amazing experience. Uh, Jeff Rickley from Thursday, James Hepfield from Metallica. I, I grew up a metalhead and I got to sit with Metallica for three and a half hours interviewing them about literally everything they'd ever done. And as a fan, it was like one of the most enriching experiences of my life. Um, the other reason I'm thankful for this job is it taught me how to be a quicker writer. To give you an idea of what my schedule was like when I was doing this job, I would get up about 10, 11 in the morning, uh, which sounds pretty great, but here's what the rest of my day would look like. Uh, we would usually arrive at the venue around 2 to 3 p.m. I would have about an hour to eat, probably my only full meal of the day. Um, and it would be somewhere that was within walking distance of the music venue. Uh, I would have to be back at the venue because between 4 and 6 p.m. is usually the only downtime a band or a musician has because they're doing promo stuff earlier in the day and then they have to do sound check and all of this other stuff. So I'd have this very small period of time in which I could do interviews, videos, if I was doing research, any of the work that I had to do to prepare for the day had to be during that window. First band usually went on at seven. If there were multiple artists, I would have to photograph all of them, take anywhere between 2,500 to 4,000 photos a night. After the show, while I'm sitting on the bus, edit those photos down to about 20 publishable ones like these, and then whatever article I was assigned, I would have to write the entire thing about 1,500 to 2,000 words, so a fairly long essay, uh, and turn it in at 7 a.m. the next morning. Go to sleep for three hours, four hours, sometimes if I could stretch it, do it all over again. Now that's an exhausting schedule. I was also in my early 20s and discovered coffee. Oh man, I love coffee, it was great. Uh, but here's the thing, when you're on a schedule like that, you can't have writer's block, you just can't. You can't sit there for an hour and be like, I don't know what I'm writing. You don't have time, you don't have the luxury. This taught me, how to outline things that I wanted to write beforehand before I wrote a word so that when I was writing the actual words, I knew what I was doing. I knew what was gonna come next. So I'm very thankful that I got to do this job. So after about a decade of working in journalism, um, I uh, got an idea for a book. 
I didn't know it was a book. I thought it was actually a short story. And I had not written fiction in a really, really long time. And I knew if I didn't give this a good try, I may never publish a novel. So I took this idea, expanded it, realized it was longer than a short story. Um, and so in September of 2012, uh, I started the draft of what would eventually become Anger's a Gift. It took me 17 months of writing to finish that one draft. Um, and it was a very long book. Uh, I had a full-time job excuse me, working um, in this industry. So I would find time on the bus, on the train, on the weekends to get as much of it done as I could. Um, it took until the summer of 2015 and about 15 drafts later to finally get a version of this book that I felt was good enough to send out in the world. So then I went out and tried to find what is called a literary agent. If you're interested in writing, especially if you're interested in traditional publishing, I highly advise you get an agent. This is a person, sort of like agents in sports or music or whatnot, who represents all your financial interests. So this person specifically goes to all these publishing houses and says, here's my client's book, it's dope, give us money for it. It's great, and that's what he does. And then he takes a little bit of the money that he earns from it, which he deserves because he does all this work that I don't have to do. Um, so you have to understand my journey from starting to write it until I got an agent was almost five years and he sold my book in 23 days and my dream came true like that. So Anger's a Gift came out on May 22nd, 2018. That is the paperback version of the cover. Um, Anger's a Gift is about a group of teenagers. You met the main character, Moss, and his best friend, Esperanza. Um, after a riot, well, the school calls it a riot, but after an incident at the school, School, his school decides to install metal detectors um, um, that all the students have to go through, and one of them injures one of his friends. And this book is about the kids deciding whether or not they want to stage a protest against this metal detector, and then what happens when that one domino falls over? What are the ramifications of them deciding to stand up for themselves? Um, it's a lot. I, I really love this book. Uh, it was born out of two things. So th I love talking about where ideas come from, too. Uh, because a lot of people read this, and then I tell them, oh, I got really mad in an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and that's why I wrote a whole book in response, because I'm a giant nerd. Um, and they don't expect that, but that's really where the idea came from. Um, and then once I came up with the idea, a lot of the inspiration was about me finally getting the chance to talk about uh, the experience of being on the receiving end of police brutality multiple, multiple times in my life. Um, I got to talk about losing my father in 2006. Grief is a huge theme of this book. Um, you know, I think more than anything else, as I was constructing it too, I just wanted to write a book where queer people of color were at the center of the narrative instead of us always being background characters or not being there at all. Uh, and being someone who's both, you know, Latinx and queer, there are virtually no characters like me in media at all. There are very, very few of them. Um, so yeah, we can talk about books but I wanna to talk to you about what it's actually like to be a writer, because people ask me, what do you do all day? So let's assume it's not this, because part of what authors do, and part of what their life is, is when they do events, but let's just assume that it is a day where I get to be home, I don't have any travel or whatnot. Um, if you are at all interested in any creative field, not just writing, if you wanna be a musician, if you wanna be a tattoo artist, if you wanna be an illustrator, if you wanna write or draw comic books, or do both of them, because I have friends who are both a writer and illustrator as well, you should get really, really good at reading emails and answering them uh, because that is the world that we are moving into. It is how most people communicate with you about job opportunities or the job that you currently have. I get between 250 and 500 emails a day. That's what I was doing when I was sitting on the couch before we started is going through my email and determining I don't need to answer that. That goes in the trash. I need to answer that as soon as this presentation is over. Um, I get stuff from my publisher, so that includes my agent, the marketing people. Um, I am about to announce a new book on Thursday, and it is with a new publisher, so I now have a whole new set of people who are emailing me every single day. I get uh, letters and whatnot, and, and, and messages from fans and readers. I get promotional stuff. I get people inviting me to events. It's a lot, and you have to stay on top of it. I also write every single day. I am currently working on 10 projects seven short stories and three books. They're all at different stages. I am waiting on edits for my next book that comes out in se September. It is the last round of edits before it goes to production. That means I finish it and it gets made into a book, which is terrifying, um, but really cool. I am working on the uh, first draft of my middle grade book and I'm working on what is called a proposal for my third YA book because I would like to sell another book to my publisher. They are all in different stages. So sometimes I'm editing, sometimes I'm working in drafts, sometimes I'm outlining a new idea. Sometimes my routine is the same where all day I just work on one project and then other days I get an email and I'm like, okay, I gotta do copy edits on the short story. Um, but then the best part of it, which is that I get to travel. I grew up very poor, we didn't go anywhere. And I get sent 
all around the world, and I mean around the world, I've gotten sent to other countries uh, to talk about my book, to talk about being a writer, and for the most part, <laughs> I don't have to pay for any of it. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> I get to fly first class for the first time last year. And I'm gonna tell the exact same joke I told last time because it's true. I was sitting in first class and I was like, I just wanna impress everyone so I can be in first class for the rest of my life. This is amazing. I get rich people. I just wanna ruin people's lives so I can be in first class. It's the best experience ever. Do you know they just give you anything you want? <laughs> anything. Can you pour your dr this drink on top of my food? They'll do it. <laughs> I mean, they'll have questions, but they'll do it. It's amazing. I've never had so much power in my whole life. Um, I get to t go to events, festivals, cons, uh, like conventions, and then school visits. I admit that I prefer this stuff to all the rest of it. Book festivals can be kind of anxiety-inducing because there's a lot of people. You never know if anyone's going to be paying attention to you. Uh, I find these a lot more intimate, a lot more fun. Uh, also, I just don't like talking to adults. I just don't. We're terrible. We're awful. Uh, you're going to get my age, and you're going to be like, oh, adults are dumb. Um, they also just don't ask good questions. I have a 50,000 billion page manuscript. Will you read it tomorrow? No, I won't. But it's a fantasy and it's about this guy who wants to save, I don't care, please stop talking. Like that's what adults ask about. Or they're like, uh, can you tell me, uh, so I'm white and I wanna write this book. Can you give me a stamp of approval on it so that I can write it? And I'm like, no, I'm not gonna do it. Just write, what do you want? I don't care. And like, you've been here for all of these. None of the questions have been like that. It's been beautiful chaos. I love it. I don't know. Uh, I prefer this stuff. This is my favorite part of being an author because I'm writing for teenagers. I don't care if adults like the book. I mean, I care if they buy it. That'd be cool. <laughs> buy my book, adults. Um, anyway, uh, last thing. These are some photos from the last couple years of my life. Um, I wonder if I can point using this. So, so this is weird. <laughs> She's gonna hate that I'm doing this. So this is my friend Danielle Clayton who wrote The Bells, uh, The Everlasting Rose, uh, Shining Pretty Things, which is actually a Netflix series that debuts this year. Uh, and then further over this is Zoraida Cordova who wrote uh, Labyrinth Loss, The Brujo Born series, uh, has a great book called Incendiary that comes out this year. The, the three of us have an office space in Harlem in New York that we call Deadline City because we're all on deadline all the time. They have a podcast named after it. Um, but it's one of the other cool things about a writer is I, they are now my best friends and the three of us write together in this office all the time and shoot ideas off uh, one another and also keep each other in line because I will play Mario Kart and not work for hours at a time and they will look over at me and be like, get off your damn phone, Mark. And I'm like, but I'm almost level 40. Okay, last thing before we go to questions so you better have thoughts in your head. It's gonna get real awkward. Um, I'm giving you all a gift. These two things I'm about to tell you have not been announced, so please do not put them on the internet. Um, but my publisher's not here, so they can't stop me, so I'm gonna do what I want. Uh, I wanna tell you about the books that I have coming out in the next year, because uh, it's been a while. It's been almost two years since Anger's a Gift came out, and I have a book coming out uh, September 15th, 2020, so this fall. It is called Each of Us a Desert. I'm very excited about this book. There was a movie that came out about 15 years ago called The Village by M. Night Shyamalan. How many of you have seen The Village before? Not a lot of people. Cool, it sucks. I hate it. But I love it, because there's something really cool in The Village. The Village is about this old-timey village, and there's a monster, and no one can leave the village, and they're scared. And M. Night Shyamalan does this thing where he puts a twist at the end of his movies. And in this movie, the twist makes everything a million times more interesting, and then 10 minutes later, the movie's over. And it has made me mad for 15 years, and because I'm a nerd, I wrote an entire book in response to it, because I wanted to explore the world that is revealed 10 minutes from the end. So this is a book about a girl um, uh, who has the magical ability to pull wrongdoing out of people's bodies. She can pull out any truth about their life. And she has this magical ability, or at least she's told, because if she does not do this every day and keep her village cleansed of sin, their God will smite them and burn them to the ground. So she is told she can never leave until the day she dies when she can pass the power on to someone else. So she's just accepted it. She's 16 years old, and she's very bitter about this, but she's like, this is my duty. And one day, she takes a story from an outsider who comes into her village, and she finds out that maybe everyone in her life lied to her about who she is and what is actually beyond the walls of her village. And she goes out into the desert to find out what is actually beyond the walls of her um, town. Uh, I'm very excited because it's super messed up. My goal was to make you both cry and have nightmares. Uh, I like horror, so there's a lot of really terrifying things in it. Uh, so that's out this year, and then uh, in about a year, I have another book coming out 
called The Insiders. Uh, this is for younger readers. It's called Middle Grade. Um, if you've read Harry Potter, there's this idea called the Room of Requirement, which is this magical room that shows up later in the series and sort of helps the kids out. And I was thinking about this, and also I just wanted to steal from J.K. Rowling because she has enough money. It's fine. She doesn't need any more. But I thought about how much I needed the Room of Requirement when I was a kid. Like, I would have loved to have a room that I could have disappeared into. So it's about three kids, who, uh, 12-year-old kids, who discover uh, a magical room that protects them and allows them to visit one another. But then the room stops letting them go back to their home until they solve a problem. Um, and it is a very magical, kind of silly book that actually deals with some very heavy topics. Very excited about it. Um, so that's what I'm working on. Thank you, friends. Um, I'm gonna go back to this page. This has like my social media. I don't know why I put face. I haven't been on Facebook in like a month. Why did I put this in here? Who's on Facebook? Like my grandma, maybe. Uh, yeah, by the way, I always put whatever meme I'm using in my author group chat the most, and because it's winter in New York, it's the, this is what everyone in New York looks like right now. All of them. Can we, can we have a moment? We're gonna have a moment. We're gonna have a moment, everyone. Let me do this. That ear pod is, the ear pod is the funniest thing I've ever, it just, look how big his ear is. Okay, anyway, sorry. That baby Yoda just walks around going dead ass. Okay, all right. It is time for questions, and I better see a hand. Oh, boy. good job. The last one, there was a lull for like 10 seconds, and I was like, oh, this is going to get awful. Your hand went up first right here in the red. When does your second book come out, and where can I September 15th, 2020. Uh, where can you get it? Anywhere books are sold. <laughs> I, I'm, I met a major publisher, so I, everywhere, which has been really cool that I can say that, because some people don't get a good treatment, and their books aren't available everywhere, but literally everywhere. Uh, I actually, uh, last year was the first time I found it in an airport. And that was kind of like a weird goal. Like I was like, my book is in an airport. And I signed it and then they yelled at me. I don't know if you've seen the author photo that's in my book. It doesn't look like that one. People, oh, here's the thing. I love doing school visits, but y'all are sometimes too much. Because one time I walked into one and that was the photo that the teacher had put up. And they were like, the student was like looking at me and then they look at the photo, and then they look at me, and you know what this, no, oh, I'm a swore, okay. You know what this person said? Is that your son? <laughs> anyway, I did not commit murder that day. Uh, who's next? Me. Wow, that was confident. Wait, wait, who said me? I can't see up there, so whoever said me, you're next. I'm not gonna fall off the stage, that would be embarrassing. What? Is it real? Because my first answer was, it's not a hologram. Is it real? How many carrots? I am from the ghettoest place in Southern California, and I live in New York now. You are asking me a question that's gonna get me robbed. No, I'm not telling you that. And yes, it is, okay. Yeah, of course it is. Who do I think I am? Actually, my favorite piece of jewelry is this ring. Uh, this ring I got at this uh, shop at the Gansevoort Market in New York City. It is this woman who does, the, it's made out of uh, iron. Uh, but she molds custom iron, and so it's got all these ivy leaves. It's a Roman coin with Athena. Um, and so she just goes to Rome and picks up like the old coins that you can find like embedded in the ground, and she made me this ring, and it's my favorite thing that I own. And yes, it's real. <laughs> I'm gonna walk out of here and just get, just shanked. It's gonna be great. All right. Please don't shank me, friend. Okay, anyway. Oh, boy. See? You were, you, okay. I want you to know, so you have pretty interesting, interesting tattoos. Can you tell me about them? That is the nicer way of what I usually get, which is, what is that thing on your neck? Um, I, most of my tattoos are music. My one true, like, I do love reading. I love writing. I'm glad this is my career. But, like, if I had to choose anything else, it would be in a band. I love music. I love writing music. I love playing music. I love playing music live. It is just, everything about it is great. So most of my tattoos are music-based. Uh, these are my, the two bands I grew up listening to in California, Bad Religion and Black Flag. They're both hardcore bands that started in the early 80s. 
Um, I have straight edge tattoos on my hands because I've been sober for 18 years now. I'm very proud of that. Um, thank you. Uh, I have a Star Wars sleeve on my right arm, which is my memorial to my dad when he passed away. This is the thing that we bonded over when I was a kid is we would just watch the original trilogy over and over. Um, I have a couple book tattoos. This is The Last Sentence of the Stranger by Albert Camus, which is one of my favorite books. Uh, on my leg, and no one asked me to show them, but you can, I will give you, since this is the last class, I have two scary stories to tell in the dark tattoos on my leg, and they are incredibly realistic, and one of them made a child cry at Disneyland. <laughs> which I felt a little bad about, because it's, it's horrible. Like, they're both gory and gross, but I, my, horror is my love of, like, I love horror movies, I love horror stories. Uh, so yeah, uh, my next tattoo I'm getting later this year, um, which is, uh, I'm really into like floral imagery and the idea of floral, like, I love the idea of like how vines and flowers can grow over something that's older. So I'm getting this huge piece from my chest over, it's not gonna cover the tattoos on my neck, but it's gonna have vines and stuff going through it. So I have this thing, I have very visible tattoos and I'm tattooed in places that are very painful. Let me just point to the one that's the worst. This is the worst. I nearly passed out. Uh, I have wanted, since I was a kid, a, um, a scalp tattoo. And I'm finally getting one. So I'm gonna have uh, this flower that goes up over my head. But the thing is, you won't be able to see it unless I get a haircut. And I love it, because it's like a secret. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Never mind, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I think I heard some, misheard something. Yeah, we'll go right here. If you were to start a band, what would you wanna call it? I'm not giving out band names. Uh-uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I was in a hardcore band in my early 20s called Future Primitive, which was a reference to the old Bones Brigade skate videos, because I grew up skating. Um, what would I, I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head. I'm not giving you a band name. Yeah, no, no, no. I'll tell you one later. I do have a really good one, but I, I can't say it because it's slightly inappropriate. Okay. Oh my God. Okay, wait, I'm just gonna tell you what I've been listening to lately. If you're a metalhead. Oh, my phone's on my person. Uh, I'm super into um, baby metal. I love baby metal so much, I would die for them. Um, I would commit crimes for baby metal. Um, uh, so the things I've been listening to, uh, 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 who wrote, um, oh, I have so much metal written in here lately. Um, what, who is it, what? Chirum Bodum, hell yeah. Oh no, I don't listen that bad, sorry. <laughs> I'm just gonna insult everyone's music taste. Um, okay. This is a weird one. There is this YouTuber who makes some of the strangest videos I've ever seen, and she has weirdly transitioned to doing pop metal. Her name is Poppy. Um, and it, yeah, her music video, or her YouTube channel is just an existential crisis filmed every single day. They're so weird. And she discovered metal a couple years ago, and she just came out with this record called I Disagree, and it basically sounds like, what if like, like old school Rage Against the Machine and old school uh, Nine Inch Nails made a band fronted by a woman. And it, every second of this weird, re there's a Beach Boys melody in one of the songs. It is the weirdest thing you'll ever listen to. But if you like weird metal, uh, and then I'm just gonna say that my favorite metal band of all time is Dillinger Escape Plan. Uh, and they're incredibly unlistenable too, so good luck. <laughs> they play this, I don't know, I don't know how to describe their music. It's just sound, it's a lot. Cool. Who's next? Man, that makes it sound like I'm picking a victim. Who, okay, choose you. I volunteer as tribute. Sorry, I ruined your question. What's your star sign? What, someone's saying Metallica? That's not a star sign. What do you think it is? What do you think it is? Aquarius. Nope. Are you a sign? I don't know. <laughs> I know what it is, and then I'm gonna ruin your lives after. No. Okay. My whole so my birthday is October twenty third. My whole life I was told I was a Scorpio. Period. Yeah. I love that you're being confident because I did my chart last year, and it turns out because I was born at twelve oh three a.m. I'm actually a Libra. So take that. I don't know what it means. People tell me it was funny because I told one of my friends that like I've been fake Scorpio my whole life, and he was like, "Well, I knew you were never Scorpio because you're not a demon," and I was like. Y'all take this seriously. I'm a Libra. I'm gonna come over here. Do y'all have a question? 
Right up there. Yeah. What? What's my favorite word? There's so many of them. My favorite word in the English language is no. I'm not joking, I really love the word no. You already asked the question. I will come back to you though. Who yells? No, I'm kidding. Who, uh, who is being asked to? Oh, yes, right there. Did my book inspire other readers to make books of their own? I, I don't know. I hope so. I mean, that's the thing. Like, you kind of put... When you put art in the world, you kind of can't control what it does and how it affects people. Uh, I don't know. I know uh, someone wrote a PhD about my book, which I was like, yo, I just tell dick jokes all day. Like, are you sure you really want to do that? Like, I, I'm not that smart. Like, that's bad. I probably shouldn't have said that. Oh, my God. Okay, all right. Here, here's the thing. I'm actually going to tell you a story about this because you reminded me of this. is that you can't control what a book does. So my book came out May 22nd, 2018. On May 23rd, I uh, took the train down to Washington, D.C., and the person doing my event with me was Jason Reynolds, who I'm a huge fan of, is an immense influence on me. And this is the person interviewing me. Like, I felt it was weird. I was like, this is wrong. Like, but he was amazing, and he was great. So we do the whole thing. We do the event. And afterwards, this... Um, person comes up. So like I had a very intentional audience I was writing this book for was people like me. And this man is like probably in his late 40s. He's white. He's older than almost everyone else in the crowd because it was mostly kids. And he comes up and he was like, I bought the book yesterday and I read the entire thing in one sitting. And I was like, thank you. That's so flattering. Like I'm, I'm so happy. Um, there's a character in my book, Esperanza, who is like me, who is a transracial adoptee. Uh, in the book, her parents are white. And if you read Anger's a Gift, you're going to find out her parents do some things that are not great. Um, and this guy said, uh, I was very surprised by Esperanza and her parents. Uh, me and my husband adopted uh, a young Mexican girl. And now I think I've messed up my whole relationship with her. And I'm like, what? And he was like, I think I now have a different perspective of what her life has been like. And I think I need to have like a really uncomfortable conversation with her. And so I'm sitting there and I'm just like, cool, so who do I make this book out to? Like, that's not the goal of the book. Like, I did not want to make that person question their entire parentage. But when you put something out in the world, it's just gonna affect people. Uh, I've never seen him again. I hope he's fine. So I ruined someone's life. That's great. Okay, we're gonna go over here. How much time do we get? We're done? Yell a question, real quick. Yeah. Go. Blue. Okay, we got. Um, if you want tickets, books, they're ten bucks. I'll sign them. If you want to just come say hi, you can come say hi.